You know how to book flights and hotels. All you're missing is a tool to plan the travel experiences you'll have once you arrive. That's why you need Viator. Book guided tours, excursions, and more in one place. There are over 300,000 travel experiences to choose from, so you can find something for everyone. And Viator offers free cancellation and 24-7 customer support for worry-free travel. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. Find travel experiences for you. Do more with Viator. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. Welcome to Comedy Album Book Club. My name is Matt, and I know it's been a while since our last episode, uh, but I am really glad to have you here, even if it is on this somber note. As you are probably aware, we lost Norm MacDonald. Norm was one of the most recognized and popular Canadian comedians, and was a unique voice in the comedy world. A contrarian who lost his job at Saturday Night Live for refusing to back down over making jokes about O.J. Simpson... He wasn't always the easiest comic to watch for a few reasons. His deadpan delivery and long walk style was so different from that of his peers, it was almost alien. But once he found the game of what he was trying to do, it could be truly astounding. That said, there were times his jokes did feel mean-spirited or old-fashioned, and this could be difficult to watch. But more on that later. Over the first few years of recording Comedy Album Book Club, I was lucky enough to meet several friends of Norm's who'd worked with him in the past. Four of them joined me to share their stories and memories of the man, shedding a bit of light on who he was and where he came from, letting us see a bit of what we may not have seen in the public persona. In this episode, I'm joined by four truly great Canadian comedians, Bruce Clark, Jim McAleese, Lara Ray, and Todd Van Allen. Before we start, a bit of history. Born on October 7th, 1959, Norm came from Quebec City, one of three sons born to Fern and Percy Lloyd MacDonald. He grew up in a fairly typical Canadian middle-class family, which seems to have informed his work. He started his comedy career in the clubs of Ottawa, becoming a regular performing at Yuck Yucks, before getting a chance to perform at the 1987 Just for Last Festival in Montreal. By this point, he had already established a voice, and as our guests today mention, he seems to have been a fully formed comedian before leaving for Los Angeles, as many Canadian comics do. Performing on Star Search and writing on the sitcom Roseanne, he joined the Saturday Night Live cast in 1993 and took up the role of the Weekend Update anchor in its 20th season. This is where I got to meet Norm. Saturday Night Live was always a part of my life, and sandwiched between Kevin Nealon and Colin Quinn, Norm was an incredibly different voice from both that of his predecessor and those that followed. His jokes were merciless, and his dry delivery stood in such contrast to the silliness of the rest of the episode, it was almost like a mid-episode palate cleanser. But he was surrounded by some of the most talented cast members the shows ever had. And this just elevated his craft. 
His impressions were always interesting to me, as they always seemed to capture the spirit of his subjects, but there was always that little sliver of norm shining through. And while his sketches, like the breaking into the Central Park pol Zoo polar bear cage sketch, seem to have a lot of absurd nonsense going on, there is that bit of dry norm. It was like he was trying to remind people of the absurdity of what was going on in front of them. That said, in later years, he tended to lean into the contrarianism, which made him difficult to listen to for some people, but it doesn't change his unique voice and his place as the king of the long walk joke. And now, here's our guests, Bruce, Lara, Jim, and Todd. That one. Yeah, yeah, baby! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I gotta say, I'm sick of you, and I'm sick of that polar bear. I'm going in. Hey, hey, Adam, if you're going to that cage, you know, be careful, because uh, the bear is still in there. Oh, my Lord. I swear to God, Norm, that was the stupidest thing you've ever said. Where would the bear be? Do you think, I think that it got wings and flew up to Canada, where everybody talks like you and says arse instead of ass? <laughs> You're very stupid, Norm, but you know that. Whee! Man, did you hear that? He calls me stupid. He just jumped into the polar bear cage, huh? Who do you think's stupid? A guy jumps into a polar cage? Or the fella people like to call Mr. Dictionary? <laughs> Farley, did you or did you not hear me tell him that uh, there was a bear still in that cage, huh? Well, you know what? I wasn't really listening that much because uh, I was trying to remember who's been killed. All right. I know Adam Sandler and before him, Tim Meadows. Thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm, today I am joined by Bruce Clark, Jim McAleese, and Todd Van Allen. Uh, thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. Um, yeah, so I I know you all have sort of worked with or or knew Norm uh, during his career. Uh, I I guess I just I'll just start by asking you how you met Norm, um, Jim. If you want to uh, to go first, uh, never met the man. No, the um, <laughs> I met him around '84 in Ottawa. He was working the Yucks Club in the Beacon Arms Hotel, and he had just done a set. And so we just kind of looked at each other across the way and nodded. Uh, but then our friendship became a little bit better than that. We conversed from time to time. But that's where I first met him, and I knew he was something special. For the record, though, I have not talked to Norm since 1996. So that's all I know is before that. So, really? Yeah, he just decided. Really? To, uh, yeah, he went. He was in another another group of people in Hollywood, so... Wow. He moved on. Yeah. Huh. I'm, so that's when I first met him in Ottawa. So I knew him for about 22 years. No, 12 years, I guess. Yeah. So whatever he's and done he between 96 and now, I know nothing. I <laughs> I don't know what he's been up to. So apparently he's He's, he's been on some TV and stuff. Right. I've yeah. heard. Yeah. But probably the same the material. <laughs> I kid because I love. Yeah. Um, and Bruce, how did you uh, meet him? Well, I started stand up a little later, like '88. So I met him. I was just doing some amateur or some open mic nights in Winnipeg. That's why I met him the first time. Mm -hmm. And then I was just like everybody that saw him the first time knew. You know, if, it, it's it's funny that the comics loved him. From the beginning because they recognize the uniqueness and the, and the, of his act and his jokes and his different way of looking but a lot of audiences weren't you gotta remember this is way before uh this is even before like there was really tv shows 
many TV shows with stand up. Mm-hmm. And the ones that you did see were mainstream. So you had, you know, guys like, you know, Bobby Kelton, who did the Tonight Show like 60 times, but very sort of generic mm-hmm. set up punchline joke. And guys like Norm were so unique that club audiences didn't know what to make of them. And I remember mm-hmm. I, there were some friends of mine at the club that night and they didn't, they just didn't like them. They just thought it was weird. And, uh, and then the next time I met him was about six months later. And I was already working as a comic and we toured a little bit where I'm middle and he was the headliner and I got to know, I got to know him fairly well, actually in that short period of time, because, uh, Erwin Barker, God rest his soul. And I opened a club in Winnipeg after the yuck yucks in Winnipeg closed and, and we had booked comics too. So, you know, there was a, you know, this is a classic norm story. We, I got him a gig at the universities and the college, and it was going to be like a $6,000 weekend for him, which was a lot of money back then. It was in mm-hmm. 1990, maybe it was just before he hit. So he'd phone me every day for two weeks before that. Hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm cutting my grass. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I can't wait to get there. It'll be great. I'm like, okay. And then two days before he was supposed to be there, his girlfriend called. And canceled because he got a job in Dennis Miller. So oh, he no. wouldn't call me. She did. <laughs> he was on, that was Norm, though. You know, as Jim yeah. can verify. But you know, you, you 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 as soon as you saw him do stand, you would only see him once, and you realize this is such a different way to think and a different way to do comedy. And his trajectory could have been predicted if you if you knew anything about comedy. He was really mm. unique for sure. Jim. Well, just before uh, Todd, sorry, Todd, but you reminded me of something, Bruce, is that he wasn't a club comic. He was a television comic. And that's why in clubs he had a, he struggled a bit. Club owners just hated seeing him come in sometimes, you know, so uh, (laughs) he had an act for television. And Letterman, that's the kind of acts they would book. They would book something that was just a little off. There was something about them. They would, you know, they would find something it's not the Bobby Keltons or myself. They wouldn't be going for a yeah. generic uh, comic on Letterman. But, I mean, he did the Tonight Show, but still right. not. Uh, he probably wouldn't have gotten Letterman. I don't know if he did Letterman or not, but. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's Bobby why Le- Letterman was like him. Letterman oh, was Bobby like Kelton. Bob, I'm talking about Bobby act, Kelton. Right? Not, so, you know. Oh, Kelton. Oh, yeah. yeah no, that type of act, yeah, you know, yeah, mainstream. Yeah. You know, Norm was not yeah. mainstream, so that's all I wanted to add into there. That yeah, uh, yeah. a lot of comics yeah. that are unique are the ones that don't do well in clubs. There, I said it. Yeah, like your, yeah, no, nope. like your, yeah, like your Stephen, your Stephen Wrights, and your, uh, yeah, uh, those kind of one-liner guys, especially they can't sustain. Norm, Norm was more of a storyteller too, but it was just so. His, his style was so low energy, really. He just stood there, right? Mm-hmm. And so if the crowd wasn't with him, you know, a lot of us had techniques and things to bring people back, whether it was talking yeah. to the audience or whatever. He just didn't, well, first of all, he didn't really care. And he just plugged away. Like, I think I, I you know, remember that story? I, well, I think I told um, uh, Matthew, or he asked me to tell this story about, I was working with him in Calgary. I was middling. And it was a Friday late show. And those are typically horrible shows. Everybody's drunk and, you know, all comics dread them. And, you know, it was okay. It wasn't a great show. So the MC brings him up and uh, I'm sitting there and he starts his act and he's doing like five minutes, seven minutes. And the people are just, you know, the murmurs just keep starting and people are talking and he did about 15 minutes and then he just started over again and did the the next. (laughs) He didn't care. He just started oh, over and verbatim did the uh, the 15 minutes again. And remember, it was like Dale, I think. Remember, Dale was running the club. And mm-hmm. to, what is he doing? I, like, I don't know. He's just doing his act again. But so yeah. he didn't. He could care less. Yeah. And 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 that's the thing. I You know, when you're famous and people just know you from your, from your public persona, they don't know that side to you. And to yeah. me, the more interesting side of Norm is those kind of stories. Because we all know how funny he was and how great he was, but the stories of that, or you know, Jim, I remember you told me the story about going to see Dave Broadfoot. And he called you to go see him. Oh. I don't know. I think it's a pretty funny story. 
Well, <laughs> we're cutting in on Tom's time, but I'll tell it real quick. Hopefully, it'll get cut out. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I said, oh, I'm thinking of going to see Dave Broadfoot's uh, dinner show. And he says, oh, get ready for a lot of jokes that end with, they should work at the post office. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and Todd, right. how how did you meet Norm? Um, uh, pretty much, pretty much like everyone else in this room, just like at 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 a show. And first of all, just to follow up on one of uh, Bruce's comments, the easiest job in show business is the follow spot operator at a Norm McDonald show. <laughs> um, he he was immobile. Um, I I met him when I was uh, starting out in comedy, so I. Uh, uh, I was at University of Waterloo at the time, and I started um, uh, going to their shows as soon as I found the place every week. And so I got to know the comics just by watching them and me and talking with them after the show. Um, I kind of met everyone kind of on the on the Yucks roster. And Norm was one of those guys that as soon as you saw him, he just went, oh, my God, like this guy is just he's he's perfect. And uh, he let me know that he was he was from Ottawa. And uh, when I went to I was on in Ottawa and co-op and everyone sort of knew that uh, new norm, like everyone knew norm up in, and this was when it was um, the hotel at um, on, on Albert street in, in Ottawa and how he was, how he's uh, running that. And they had an established amateur night. So that's where I, you know, we sort of started. I think uh, by that point, norm had, had moved on, but the tales of him coming to that room and trying out stuff, um, he would show up every week with a new five because no one told him you could do the same jokes. Over. So he just kept doing new material, which was great. And he, the crowd would be dying of laughing. And he'd go, I, I don't think I did well. And it's like, no, no, you did good. And so Howard obviously just promoted him, you know, got, got the word in, in Mark's ear that you got to move this guy up. And uh, by the time I got back, I did like, you know, one, my first semester at uh, Waterloo, my first semester in Ottawa. So I got to, I got to do the, the, um, the amateur route, uh, route in, in Ottawa. By the time I got back, um, Kitchener before I had left, let me do a spot. Uh, and I did both shows for them. And then by the time I got back, they actually had an established amateur night. Mm -hmm. So we were, so this, uh, it, it was it was just like the the usual model. You kind of finished like the Wednesday or the Thursday night regular show, and then they put us up. And you could stay if you wanted. That's how it worked. This isn't going to be as good as the thing you saw. And but the the nights were all kind of crammed together when we, were, when we got to watch Norm middle at that point. He was just he wasn't headlining. He wasn't hosting. He was just he was the middle act. And it's like oh my god, like he's like a step from us, but miles ahead of us. Yeah, you know, positionally he was close, but talent-wise, forget it. Like you just you, you just acknowledged it. Um, and so by the time I got back to Ottawa again uh, in the next semester, he was headlining by that point. Yeah. Um, and we and we got to see him kind of you know fill forty five minutes. And, and Ottawa really had a good uh, love for him. Yeah. Like that city really enjoyed um, uh, Norm, just like they loved Mike. Like everyone sort of had that um, that sense of this is our guy. And, you know, he came from this scene and we sort of we had that as well. And when he when he got onto the Pat Sajak show, that was a huge moment for all of us in that community because um, that was his network television debut. And we everyone set their VCRs and everyone huddled around TVs to watch it live. And it was wonderful. It was it's, it's like when it's it's similar to uh, if, you, if you've seen the documentary when stand up stood out about the Boston comedy scene. Mm -hmm. There's um, a similar moment when Stephen Wright gets the the nod for the Tonight Show, and everyone in the Boston mm -hmm. comedy scene kind of hovers around TVs and, and watches it. And the same thing was with us. We were like, "Oh my God, here comes Norm. Who cares if it's <laughs> Pat Sajak? This is great." And it, and it was. It was. Uh, you know, we we got to see the jokes that he had been working on for years, and suddenly, you know, take to the air. And it's fun when you see like, "Oh my God, like that's our guy." And Ottawa was like this weird club. Like when I started, one of my contemporaries was Tom Green. Tom Green was doing shows at the same time I was. So uh, I think he's doing okay. Yeah, he's, he's surviving. You know? He's surviving. Yeah. yeah. Um, but now you, you, you've, you've all sort of touched on it to some degree. Like he was, he's not your normal club comedian. He's not, 
his humor is like story, more storytelling oriented. If you had to describe Norm's work to somebody who'd never heard his, his stuff before, like how would you describe it? Hmm. No, that's yeah. Uh, Fully committed. So just surprising. Like Full, you don't. Yeah. You're, you're just surprised when the punchline comes, and it's you know, like that Charles Ming joke he did. You know, that one where it's like, uh, you know, a lot of guys get caught or something that, you know, you know, like Al Capone got caught for tax evasion and Charles Ng was arrested for that unknown law in Canada where you got to have a vowel in your last name. So it's like, <laughs> who would think who would think of that? Like, I, that's, yeah. you know, yeah. but, you know, you know, Norm was an interesting guy and Jim maybe didn't talk to him after that time. But, you know, I was I was in Montreal that just for laughs and norm and i were standing at the back of the saint denis theater and brian regan was on doing his act and i had just worked with norm that week and regan started doing this bit about being the newscasters on you know the um the anchors giving the news and the people behind them on the typewriters and making funny faces and i turned to norm and said hey he's doing your stuff man you just did this and he goes ah, how do you know i wasn't doing his <laughs> so, Norm wasn't like an angel by any stretch. He would, you know, he 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 was doing, and I think he did it just because he was so bored that he would just do it. And I don't know why, but he, mm. there was there's several occasions where he was doing like somebody else's, like famous people's bits for whatever reason he he chose to just out of boredom. Or well, somebody, you, know, Jim, you might be able to speak to that. Too, somebody told know. me last week that you know he did that a lot, and I didn't know that because I didn't. I didn't. I was a headliner, so I wasn't working with him. Yeah, he would be bored. It's not that he was stealing somebody's joke to get ahead. He was just doing it because he was bored, and so he would do somebody's right. joke, mm -hmm. right. you know. But it wasn't in his routine every night. I don't yeah. think. Um, no. no. What I liked. One thing yeah. I did notice about him, and a lot of comics are like that is that when he would land, say, a television spot, he wouldn't tell anybody because we don't want to be embarrassed in case it gets canceled, right? Or you don't do well. Mm -hmm. And so he had booked uh, Star Search International. So that was a different show where it was only seen outside North America. And back then in the 90s, mm -hmm. we didn't have access to look at anything around the world. And so bunch of comics were sitting in a restaurant and Greg Scott from VC was there. And I just love the way Greg told me the story. He says, and Norm walks in and I said, Norm, I heard you were on Star Search International. No. Yeah, I heard you got like the lowest score ever for a stand-up comic. All you hear is, what a <laughs> bastard. What a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but he, So he did the show and didn't tell us that he'd uh, had done horrible on the on on the show. <laughs> so, how many times did I freeze yeah. in the middle of that story? All like, the way through, we got you. We got you zero. Oh, wow. so, yeah. but to to be fair to to Norm's credit, it was Star Search, <laughs> yes. and not to not not to take a Dennis Miller line, but um, Star Search is the only show where the Rolling Stones would lose to Quarter Flash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that's why that, uh, I, kids I think, ask your parents to ask your parents about I, I th the I Rolling think, Stones. Yeah, I think that has a great deal to do with his success that he actually didn't really care on some level. Like obviously he wanted to be successful and wanted to be and do well, but at some point, I think he sort of knew what was important and what wasn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he his his thing and 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 you saw it definitely in his in his later days, and it was. It, it was the twinkle in his eye kind of at the at, in his early stages, but it was full blown all through his DNA, um, you know, in his in his latter day work was his ability to commit to what he started. So when he began his set, like to, to the to the point of, re, of, you know, redoing the set, you know, just restarting that show halfway through is like. He's going to do that because he is going to commit to that bit when, you know, he is showing up on shows and telling street jokes as if they're his own. 
yeah. and owning that and, you know, improving his way through them and, and just adding yeah. way more charm and comedy yeah. to those jokes that he would, ever would have had in, in the, in the first place but at, and watching yeah. him dig into an audience that didn't dig him. Yeah. But at that point, when you're on, you know, Conan, for instance, and you're Norm MacDonald, he knew this. Yeah. He could do anything and people would be entertained. That's why yeah. he did yeah. it, I think. You know, if you did yeah. that in a club or a show where it was your first, you know, your first Conan, you would never do that. But he, you know, he had already been established. So, I mean, it's a lot yeah. easier to go in there and goof off when you're, you know, everybody, well, it's just Norm, you know. Well, I think he but, toyed uh, with that before yeah, he left Toronto. Yeah. But he, but he, like he was doing that yeah. before he left to go to yeah. Hollywood just to uh, be able to think on his feet, you know, and not worry about yeah. uh, the, the material. The, Sorry. And I also remember the, the, be- the beautiful part of yeah. Sorry, one quick thing to Todd's point, when he yeah. talked about like doing all the new material, I remember we were working together one time and he said, Oh man, I, I just worked in Toronto, you know, on the Thursday, like Wednesday and Thursday was like the, you'd have like five or six guys doing 10 minutes. Right. And and he says, you know, I was working with Greg Morton, and Greg's a hilarious guy. And he said, oh, it's a Thursday yes. night, and he's doing his closer, like his big closer with the <laughs> Tina Turner thing, on a Thursday yeah, yeah, night. Yeah. And Norm's like, why would you do that? You, it's, you're supposed to be trying new stuff. Like it was like to your Todd's point, it was like that's what he always did. Mm-hmm. That's why yeah. he was so wealthy with material. Mm-hmm. Yeah, his 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 full on, just just watching him dismantle a, a crowd. Um, and, and when I, when I say dismantle, not just destroy them comedically, which he did often, but he would, he could very easily figure out a crowd and, and just still go, Nope, this is my game plan. It's like, it's up to you to figure this out. And what, what saved him and what made him was his personality and his delivery style like that, like when to, to Jim's point when he goes, Oh, that's just norm. Yeah, that's just yeah. norm. And that's. That's what is the brilliance of this is just the the ability to to really give people something that is completely different from everything else. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is just uh, he was also was a very a smart guy. Watch. He had a very high IQ. I can't yeah. certify that. But he, but I heard he, he had did like one sixty. Yeah. yeah. What's that, Bruce? He didn't or. Yeah. For yeah, he pretended, I think I talked to Matthew about this. He, you know, he, he would, uh, and, and Lara, too bad she's not here because she tells the story better, but he would pretend like he, like, oh, I'm reading that Dosky, Dosky, yes, what is it? Dosky, yes, you know, like, <laughs> pretend he didn't know who it is, you know, like, and, you know, yeah. I don't know why I think he did that because his persona on stage and when he's delivering those, he came across as kind of a bumpkin, you know? And if he if he was you know if he displayed his intellect and used his uh, you know richer vocabulary it wouldn't it wouldn't serve him well for his act but yeah. it was weird because I remember in in the very few moments when you have a real conversation with him as Jim can attest it's difficult to do we did mm-hmm. talk about writers and and novels and things and when well, actually I opened for him in Winnipeg in like 2010 we did this big show at the theater. And, and he was, I picked him up in his uh, hotel room and he was, he was online gambling, which he wasn't supposed to be doing. And I said, what are you doing? I thought you weren't supposed to, ah, it's only like 50 bucks. <laughs> like he didn't care. <laughs> so, so, but we did, we talked about some writers and how uh, he was influenced by uh, when he worked on Saturday Night Live. I can't remember the guy's name. Um, he died of cancer, brain cancer. Herb Sargent? Name, Jim, you might know. No, the other guy. Oh. Real smart uh, on air uh, or behind the scenes. No, he was a writer. He was one of the. He was on air in the first season, I think. And oh, he, um, you know oh, jeez, I mean. Sergeant. Uh, um, no. O'Donoghue. Had, do, uh, um, yeah, Peter O'Donoghue. Peter. O'Donoghue. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah O'Donoghue. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, Norm was really, really smart and just didn't. Uh, and I remember we we another clarity moment when we were working in calgary together and i you know we call comics talk and i said well, what why do you do like why do you do this well what do you think it is and he said, oh, he said when i was young i used to go to jazz clubs and watch the musicians and comics and i just loved it and norm is one of the few comics i know i don't think he's ever had a real ever had a real job that i know of yeah. like he's one of the few guys yeah so um, his life like to speak to todd's point he is he was a true artist right it was just yeah. comedy that's yeah. what his whole thing Okay. Great. Uh, we've been joined by a, a another special guest, uh, Lara Ray. Uh, 
if you want to introduce yourself, Lara. Yeah, I'm, my name is Lara Ray. I'm a, I'm a comedian. I'm the former uh, co-founder and artistic director of the Winnipeg uh, Comedy Festival. And um, I was friends with Norm for, you know, 36, 37 years, going back to the early 1980s. Um, and so I just I thought it would be a fine tribute uh, to Norm uh, to forget this uh, was happening, uh, to be 40 <laughs> minutes late, to not know how to work the technology. <laughs> And then in about three minutes, just stand up and walk away and uh, let you guys continue. And so that's my agenda. I don't know what you've all been talking about, but it's great to be here with some dear, dear, dear friends, uh, Jim McAleese, uh, Bruce Clark, and, and, you know, all, all my memories um, of these men and, and of this time, you know, are, 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 are quite fulsome and, and incredible. And part of the, I guess, the if there's a silver lining to... To Norm's passing, it's really to just have gone on that time machine back to, you know, those those glorious uh, and and incredibly um, dysfunctional days. You know, when we all started in in, in comedy uh, with Norm and and with the two uh, gentlemen that join us tonight. So I'm I'm very pleased to be here. Um, also, you know, uh, I'll give a series of excuses because that's something Norm would. Uh, do as well each one contradicting the other so the other reason i'm late of course is i was feeding i was feeding the poor and so i just wanted that on the, on the record uh, but as you can see i'm still wearing my apron i was feeding poor people so excuse me uh for being late for your fucking podcast but anyway that's just one thing uh and then uh yeah and then uh, otherwise uh you know i i screwed up the time uh zone you know which i in tribute to norm um uh, I, I did the time oh. thing wrong and then uh, also, I, I just didn't care enough to be here. And so it's good to be here. And uh, I welcome you all and, and share some, some painful and happy and truthful memories about somebody who was a, who was a force of nature all, as, as a comedian, also as a, as a human being. And, uh, and uh, I'm just uh, very, very happy to be here. Um, so I, I've asked the others this. Uh, how, how did you meet Norm? I met Norm in uh, Ottawa. And uh, I was in a comedy. I was in a comedy uh, team uh, back in the 1980s with a comic called uh, George uh, Westerholm. Uh, for the purpose of this, you know, we were in a comedy team called Alan George, and uh, we were in uh, Ottawa at the uh, Beacon Arms uh, Hotel, a very storied um, shithole. And um, <laughs> Norm was a uh, Norm was an up and coming young uh, comic. Um, couple of years older than us, but had just kind of started and um, was, uh, you know, he was kind of a, a pro professional, uh, whatever term Yuck Yucks uses for uh, somebody who's who's good but doesn't get paid. That's where Norm was uh, in the status of, uh, of stand up at the time. And um, as I've said in, in several other interviews, you know, after he, he passed, um, he already had it. And uh, most comics are really hit it out of the park, already have it that first few times on stage. And, uh, you know, some of the bits and some of the jokes that Norm continued to do in the first 10, 15 years of his career, I saw on that first night in Ottawa. And so it was, it was magical uh, to see somebody who was so ready and so already there in terms of the voice and in terms of all those kind of things. And then he moved to Toronto and that's when I kind of first got to know him and with George and, and a comic called um, Stevie Ray Fromstein, uh, we worked uh, one very happy summer uh, on a, on a sitcom pilot, uh, actually two sitcoms pilots, um, the, the four of us. Uh, and that was uh, at a time when uh, Norm was constantly interrogating um, Stevie Ray, who had lost a, uh, uh, testicle to uh, cancer, and so Norm would call him uh, One Nut Fromstein. And uh, back in the day, he'd go uh, every time we'd have a break, he'd go, Hey, so uh, hey, uh, One Nut Fromstein, uh, how do you know uh, when you got cancer? Right? And then um, it became, uh, you know, kind of obs an obsession with Norm, uh, just interrogating Steve about cancer. And then uh, lo and behold, then he came in, I remember, late one day, and he goes, Hey, hey I'm sorry, I'm late. I was uh, throwing up blood, right? And we're like, Norm, that's not good. Uh, go to the hospital. And so Norm went oh, to the hospital, oh. and it turned out he had stomach cancer. And they took out, I think, almost half to three-quarters of his stock. And so during wow, that time, geez. 
it was uh, it was very difficult, and we thought that Norm was going to die, and I think he did come close to dying. Um, and then uh, there was a pattern that I think you know was established, um, you know, towards the end of his uh, death, uh, which was that he was uh, quite reticent and uh, kept it all to himself. And so we knew that he was sick, but we didn't know how sick he was because he kind of cocooned and hid himself. And then obviously he did recover and was was off to a glorious career. Um, but I think it, uh, it, it is probably pretty uh, evident that like uh, Napoleon, they said that Napoleon, you know, the reason he always had his hand in his... Uh, in his shirt there is he had some kind of gastric issue and part of the checking of the uh, abdomen and the rubbing of the belly um, was was that was from that initial uh, bout of cancer and as someone with diverticulitis disease I understand that I think partially it's comfort and partially it's just you know there's there's still a bit of residual kind of pain and tightening from the surgery and all that kind of stuff so one of these habits that he developed over the years I think was a was a bit of a, a precursor and, uh, and a bit of an omen that, uh, you know, that this uh, terrible and horrible disease that, that takes people so young um, would, would return and, and finally end his life uh, in such a sad and sad way. And, you know, he had more to give. And I, I think we're all broken hearted about that part of it. But he was a force in all of our lives. And because he was a big personality and he was terribly funny. And of all the comics we started with, he probably went to the big show. Um, you know, at a higher level and for longer than any uh, comic, at least that I knew personally. And so we were all very proud of that. You know, and he had his, he had his generous moments, you know, when he got on SNL. I remember he organized an edition for me, you know, as a writer. And, uh, you know, and so so these were things, uh, nice things that I remember about the man. And um, I was sorry that I didn't uh, get to see him uh, closer to his uh, his his final last few years and I you know I followed him obviously as, as a fan and as a friend and I would see pictures of him and you know Bruce and I talked about this and we'd, we'd kind of wonder this and that just based on his appearance and but you never know yeah. and uh, so it was both a terrible shock to wake up it just came out of nowhere that one afternoon what the fuck and then but at the same time you know it wasn't a hundred percent surprising you know that um, once again he was ill yeah. but um very do, you, sad. do you remember after after that show in Winnipeg, Laura, when we went out to the Fairmont after, and he was telling that yeah, yeah. he couldn't get health insurance because he went to the doctor and basically told the doctor he had all these symptoms, even though he didn't, because he wanted to get everything checked. So he said, "Oh, yeah, I yeah. got this. Got a, this stomach is sore here, and I got a lump here, and this." And the doctor was like, "Geez, okay." And give him, put him through everything, and there was nothing wrong with him. But then he couldn't. He had trouble getting health care insurance. Because it was on his record that he had, you know, all these tests for different things. <laughs> yeah, before it yeah was, I mean, uh, like many, yeah, he was, I mean, yeah. one of the, one of the, there were many vectors where we bonded, you know, off outside of a love of, of comedy and an appreciation of old school comedy. You know, he was really, you know, we loved, we all loved Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra and that kind of comedy. And, uh, but the other uh, place that we did bond was, I think we were both, you know, uh, Norm like big words. So, you know, we were both um, valetudinarians. We were both hypochondriacs, you know, and so I'm constantly concerned about what what kind of illness is going to befall me. And so we certainly did have that in common. But unfortunately, on a couple of occasions, his, his guessing was right. And, uh, you know, and, and that disease finally took his life, which is terribly sad. Now, think, uh, um, over the last few days, or sorry, go ahead, Jim. Well, I was just going to say, uh, Larry, you, you you touched on something that most comics that came after um, after us, like the original guys, every young comic was touching their stomach. The original six, uh, we, we were called the original six. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, in Edmonton, they thought it was the original seven. So they thought I was an artist. <laughs> um, they didn't get the original six <laughs> reference. But anyway, but a lot of young comics would, pat their tummy while they're d delivering the jokes and it's like they're channeling their inner norm you yeah. know and yeah he, no question he about was, it no question <laughs> about it he he loved playing pranks and stuff he got me a tonight show audition when i was in la in 93 and we went to the improv because i wanted to do a set before the next night when jimmy brogan was coming down to see me and um by the time I was scheduled to go on, there was no one in the room, and that's when they usually close the show. So Norm, and I, Norm says, hang on, and he goes into the bar next door, and he brings two women out into the club, 
<laughs> and he sits with one at the back and is talking to her. And I'm on stage doing my set to one woman in the middle of the room. <laughs> and he's at the back talking to this woman. And I'm doing my routine just to get the timing out to this woman. Very conversational. And he just yells out, do the hockey bit. You know, every five <laughs> seconds. Just do the hockey bit. <laughs> 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 the hockey just, bed was uh, in the, uh, the third star, Gary Darnoffer. Right. Yeah. yeah, where it's perfect for LA. <laughs> Gary Darnoffer. <Dornhofer. laughs> uh, now, one of the things was, you know, when the, that was something about Norm too, you know, uh, like, uh, and the other McDonald shared this as, you know, he was a huge fan of comedy and he had a tremendous amount of respect for other comics. And so he was a bit of a magpie. Um, and the, you know, he would, he would remember your bets, you know, and, and he would, uh, you know, he, he definitely had his favorites, you know, and he was, mm -hmm. he was, uh, you know, quick to, quick to say so, you know, and, uh, and we all had our yeah. favorite norm bits as well, you know, but, but so many, you know, come to mind that backseat metal, you know, those beautifully structured, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, Bruce can maybe jump in on this, but, you know, this is something that really is interesting, especially when you have a long career like Norm did, that, to you know, that Norm really was a comedy comedian for everybody for so much of his career. And bits like Backseat Middle and, and Wiener Dog and all those things were really classic old school bits that could just as easily belong on a, like a Shelley Berman or a Bob Newhart album. And then I think it wasn't so much that, and you, Bruce, you can jump in. It wasn't so much that Norm changed. It's that his audience changed. And, and for a bunch of reasons, he became attractive to a certain kind of segment of the population, kind of young male, young male fans. Well, that that was, like yeah. people like doing no, no aspersions on yeah. any of these comics. I love them all. Anthony Jeselnik, uh, Jim Norton, uh, Jimmy Carr that Norm really fell into that category as a kind of dark comic, comic, a kind of sinister comic, a kind of pushy, edgy comic. But most of my memories of Norm are doing material that really was really immersed in that old school, classic, structured bit, you know, like backseat middle, that was just so, you know, very much closer to, to Brent Butt you know, for most of his career than yeah. Jesselnik or, or these comics that came came along later. This kind of dark, cynical edge um, that was really worthwhile and, and really helped Norm with the comic wasn't the fundamental part, I think, of Norm's comic DNA. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, I think, I think when he started doing Stern and all that, the young male kind of crowd, that's when his audience changed a little bit. But I think you're right. Yeah, I think because when you think about his old, like those old bits and when we used to work them in the like the early 90s, it wasn't, there was no sort of not a nasty edge to him at all. But, and you can see that in like we were just talking before you got on about the street jokes he would tell on Conan. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah, very much, you know, and that style. was from the British influence, like Ronnie Corbett and Dave Allen, you know, taking a street joke and yeah. just, you know, expanding it just by being kind of a funny raconteur, you know, and I know that he was uh, immersed because we had many conversations about this in the kind of raconteur guest star on shows like the tonight show. And these bits, you know, where, where George Goebbels would flick his cigarette right. or Dean Martin would flick, you know, all these classic show busy yeah. kind of mm -hmm. uh, couch moments. Uh, Norm had an encyclopedic knowledge of, and I think really r tried to reproduce through his entire career to great effect. And it was when I most loved uh, Norm is when he when he was really channeling uh, that kind of old school comedy entertainer energy. And he said to me many times, you know, uh, things he'd heard from old school comics, which is if you do political humor, you're going to split your audience in half. Right. Be an entertainer for everybody. Right. Don't say a bunch of stuff that's going to piss people off. And it was terribly interesting because one of his, I don't know if it was his very last, but I think it was his last Netflix special was such a white bread, but extremely funny uh, stand up comedy special with no swear words, no dark material. Right. And it really was a full circle kind of thing. 
and I don't want to do any Monday morning fucking fortune telling on on what people's mindsets are. But I, we we do know for a fact that he had some inkling that he was he was sick and that it may have shortened his life. But it is interesting to me that one of the last things he did really established himself in that kind of elk or genre. And again, I'm not making any categorization uh, as one is better than the other because I love both of those styles of comedy, right? But I just, that's only my personal observation, you know? And I really loved that. I really loved that last special, you know? I really, really did. And it was so fucking refreshing, which is the other thing that Norm was good at, was was playing against trends. If everyone was doing one thing, Norm would do something else. And it was part of his charm and part of his oppositional personality. But it really was something that was made him interesting. You know, he always kept you on his toes. And every interview he did was fascinating because you never knew what he was going to say. You know, and, that, and he was extremely intelligent. And why he constantly was obsessed with playing that down, I have no idea. But he's one of the intel- yeah. most intelligent people and one of the most well-read people in comedy that I've ever met. Yes. And... And prolific. And I mean, prolific. Like that, yeah, the, yeah. The, the 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 joke the joke that you're talking about the the backseat middle joke the uh, the the legend is that he wrote that on the way to a gig. No, no question about and it. Blur- and blur and blurted it out that night. Oh yeah, absolutely. Was yeah, flawless, he was a very you know? organic. And yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, there's and another my question has always been. Who was? Who were the other two guys in the front seat? Yeah, that's, that's who a good I question. I'm sure there's a bunch I, of. I have ideas. There'll be a bunch of comics yeah. that claim they were. I've, I really don't have any idea. But I mean, I was there for the development of, of some of the bits. You know, not the some not the most classic, but uh, old man sack. Right. I was telling Bruce this the other night. Mm-hmm. So we go. Hey, I saw an old man sack. Right. Uh, that was actually when we were working on that uh, uh, sitcom pilot together. And uh, Stevie Ray Fromstein's old Jewish dad uh, came home and we all had a sauna. We went down to the sauna in the condominium they lived in. And he's like, oh, my God, I saw Fromstein's old man sack, man. Oh, my God. (laughs) And then, you know, and then that night, the old man sack uh, routine started to uh, kind of foment and uh, and develop, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I'd love to share just because, you know, I, I still adore these two premises. So the two. Uh, sitcom scripts we were working on that summer, uh, neither of which went to fruition, uh, really kind of exemplified what I'm talking about right now. And the first was called Four Sharps in a Flat. And so George and I were punk rockers. Uh, Norm was kind of a washed up Dean Martin lounge singer. And uh, Stevie Ray Fromstein was a folk singer. And we all lived together and our careers were on, on the, on the, on the fritz. And so we had to become roommates, but it was constantly incongruous because the Norm's character was an alcoholic. Steve Fromstein was a pot smoking kind of hippie and George and I were uh, hotel smashing kind of punk rockers. But one of the jokes that Norm and I worked on together, which I was very proud of, was that Steve, um, uh, Steve's character, the folk singer, his name was uh, Steve Bradshaw. And Steve Bradshaw, there was a group that we made this group up, a folk group called Hook, Line and Sinker, right? And then Steve Sinker dies. And so they get to this guy, Steve Bradshaw, (laughs) and they say, can you change your name to Steve Sinker so we can keep going with Steve Sinker? And he refuses. So then the tour is Hook, Line and Bradshaw, which which was a classic kind of norm (laughs) joke. And I just love it. And then the other one that really spoke to Norm's obsession with things like 70s television was the other pilot was for, was a show that was a parody. And this was before Naked Gun, uh, a parody of 1970s five episode uh, uh, cop shows. And it was called The Falls Guys. And it was two cops in Niagara Falls, Ontario. And uh, every episode ended with them fighting over the edge of the falls with the bad guy and the bad guy falling over and going into Niagara Falls every single week without fail. And then uh, Norm, who played one of the detectives, would go to the uh, Louis Dussault uh, Wax Museum on Clifton Hill because it took place on the Canadian side. That was the other joke, the crime-free Canadian side. Uh, he would yeah, go yeah, yeah. and he would, uh, he, would, he would get advice from the Telly Savalas wax kojak thing and he go ah oh, oh, kojak i just i don't know where this case is going man and then and then he would kind of he would channel kojak 
you go, oh, baby, here's what you got to do, right? Because Norm, 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 the other thing about Norm, like Lenny Bruce, is he, he didn't start as an impressionist, but Norm was a great impressionist and he could do everybody. And he used to do a Kojak bit that was literally, and I wasn't in the room, but I saw the episode where he would basically do uh, Telly Savalas, but it was literally ripped out of a Kojak episode. And so a young woman is murdered and then her family come from a small town and they come into the police station and Kojak's deputy, I can't remember his name says, uh, Kojak, uh, the family's here. Cracker, Crocker. And then the, uh, the, the, the family come, you know, the Midwest couple and the mother's crying and she goes, I can't believe this happened. She was such a good girl. And then Kojak says, she was a good girl. Mum's apple pie, 4th of July. She was a hooker. <laughs> Norm, Norm, Norm said that line in my presence, I don't know, 150 times. And every time he did it, we laughed. <laughs> the other one, of course, was uh, Archie Bunker and Edith doing the Julius Caesar. Oh, yeah. Mm. Beware the, now, beware uh, the guys from March. Hey, would you quit stabbing with you with the knife there, Edie? Hey, hey, hey. Anyway, he was, yeah, he was a great, he could do it. And, and he did other comics as well. He could do everybody. We can all do Norm. And then Norm yeah. could do every, every comic that he worked yeah. with. You know, he was a real, he was a real magpie that way. Or, no, not magpie. Uh, Mimic, uh, yeah. a, a minor bird. A magpie minor is somebody who steals. Oh, yeah. uh, but that's, um, anyway, go on. Yeah. Now, I, over the last few days, um, I've, a lot of people have been sort of sharing, you know, a lot of younger comedians have been sharing what they took from his stage persona and his state and his bits and how they that impacted them. What's something that like, is there something that you'd want people to know about who he was off stage? Like what people didn't really see beyond that that stage persona? Like what's something that you think people should be aware of in that regard? Um, you guys want to, I mean, I have, I have a few things well, to say, but yeah, you guys want to like go we, first? You know, we, uh, we talked about, uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, we're all, we all contain multitudes and Norm wasn't like we, before you got on Laura, we talked about how he did was doing Brian Regan stuff when I was working with him. And then he was like, ah, maybe I was doing his, but you know, there's a funny story and you know, Norm was an odd cat. And so he had a he had a son, Dylan, and I guess Dylan's about twenty seven or twenty eight now, I think. So he had the baby, <clears throat> and he used to be chummy with Rothman, <clears throat> Jeff Rothman, a very funny stand up in from Montreal, lives in L.A. And he calls him, and he says, "Hey, you want to play tennis tomorrow?" And Jeff goes, "Okay, what time?" He says, uh, "Pick me up at eleven. We got the the I got the court book for eleven thirty. He goes, okay, so he gets to his house at 11, and he goes, uh, you want to come see my baby? And Jeff's like, what? So you had a baby? He said, yeah, I had a baby. He said, when? He said, yesterday. He said, you had a baby yesterday, and you're going to play tennis? He goes, yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with that? So he goes, before we get to the court, can you drive me to the Roseanne set? Because he was working for Roseanne then. I got to drop off this gift basket because they sent me a beautiful – uh, bouquet and fruit and stuff for the baby. So he's like, okay. So they get to the Roseanne and just waiting in the parking lot for him. It's like 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. He gets back. It's like 11. Now it's 1140. And he goes, uh, he's Norm. I thought you said the court was 1130. He goes, no, one o'clock. Can you take me to, and then he got him to drive him around everywhere. Cause Norm never drew. <laughs> no. Drive around or deliver all these things. And so how do people before they go play tennis? So he was, yeah, he was, a. Uh, you know, he'd be a hard guy to be a real friend to because, you know, he didn't give anything. And he was and that speaks to his, I think, a lot of comics who are super successful like that become kind of encased and, in their own. Personality. Absolutely. And then, you know, in, in many ways, you know, and I won't go into all of them. Um, if there was somebody, you know, who I knew personally and then somebody I knew who, from reading his work and reading his journals and stuff, that there were some colleries between um personality wise between uh, Norm and John Cheever and uh, when Benjamin Cheever John Cheever's son edited his journals which were uh, quite 
um, honest and, 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 and provocative when they, they first came out and, and, and spoke a great deal about uh, his own private thoughts and feelings. Uh, Benjamin looked for uh, the entry on the day that uh, he was born, his uh, son, and uh, there was no mention in the diary of in the three pages of what went on that day that Cheever had had another kid. And so, you know, we all tend to be rather narcissistic in this uh, in this business. Yeah. Um, the other thing, of course, and there was a there was a New York Times article about it that that, that was rather superficial. But uh, Norm and you can Google it um, because Norm spoke about it quite eloquently and fascinatingly. Um, Norm was a Christian and Norm was a religious person, and a lot of people don't know that. And it was sincere and it was real, and um, and that that was a side of him I think that people didn't know. And uh, it was a very interesting side of him. And he's, he, you know, it was another vector, too, because, uh, you know, it's an interest of mine and something I'm happy to talk about. Uh, one of the regrets I have uh, with, 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 you know, the early days, you know, was there was so much drinking. Um, not so much on Norm's end. I mean, Norm was, um, I mean, I think I've told this story. The one, the one drunk story I had with Norm was when we were in Niagara Falls and, and uh, just before the show, um, uh, he, he's nowhere to be seen. And then he finally shows up uh, in, uh, like two minutes before he's supposed to go on. And I said, where were you? And he goes, uh, oh, man, uh, we drank so much last night. I I threw up all over my shirt, you know. And by shirt, it was like a, you know, it was like a, you know, a, a, dr- a dress shirt, right? Uh, and, and I mm-hmm. said, what, what, Norm, you only brought the one shirt? And he's like, yeah, hey, yeah, I only brought the one shirt. And then I said, uh, so, uh, so where were you? You had to go get a shirt. He goes, yeah, yeah, I went back to Toronto. Uh, get a new shirt. And I said, uh, Norm, uh, why didn't you just go to a store and buy a shirt? He goes, hey, I never thought of that. You know, and that was a very uh, uh, perverse part of Norm's uh, personality. Uh, and I don't know if he, he pretended to be adulpated um, to kind of deflect from having <laughs> serious conversations about anything. But I would say one of my biggest regrets was that somebody who fascinated me so much intellectually and somebody who had so many common interests with me seemed to be incapable of being generous with that part of himself um, at such a time as, as, as it would be. Uh, mutual, right? So he'd, you know, he'd want to talk to you about it when it was inappropriate, and you know. So this idea of a kind of a of a of a relationship dynamic was not something I think many of us, at least in uh, the starting out gang, experienced with Norm. It was a one way oh, well. street kind of a uh, thing. But I mean, that's show business. I have. But sure, I mean, you know, I think we all saw characteristics and you know uh personality traits and norm that would conform and fall into many different dynamics Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. outside of neurotypicality like many of us you know and we can speculate on them but yes i think they did play a role but i also think that uh, eccentricity uh did run in his family uh but also i think eccentricity was a was a guard and a wall that he put up uh, sometimes mm-hmm. to deflect from uh, being confronted on on behavior that was not uh, his finest hour, uh, and also just because um, deep emotional conversations, uh, for whatever reason, seemed very difficult. And uh, it's it's interesting in so many ways because I knew and and, and cared for them both uh, that Mike and a Norm, um, in terms of my interpersonal relationship, uh, had many many similar kind of things and and similar upbringings. You know, and so that may be part of it, too. Uh, And I hope one day his autobiography uh, was very funny and somewhat revealing and very fascinating and very funny. But I would love one day to read a really comprehensive, uh, open hearted and uh, multifaceted story of this man, because I do think that he was a fascinating uh, human being. And, uh, you know, and he burned, he burned like a fire. And sometimes those that got very close to that bright fire uh, got singed and burned. <clears throat> and I would say in terms of my relationship with Norm, I was, I was singed, you know, and every one of those singings I have fully recovered from. And, um, you know, my, my 
biggest and deepest feeling uh, right now, uh, a week or so after his passing, is uh, my great regret that I didn't know he was sick and the inability to have some kind of a meaningful conversation with somebody who I knew for so many years, just to say goodbye mm-hmm. and just to talk about old times just one more time. And and that's the part, I think, that really, really makes me the saddest of all this uh, that's going on, you know? Yeah. Um, now, what if we can go around the room, as it were, w- what is your favorite Norm MacDonald bit? Uh, uh, Todd, why don't we start with, with you on uh, that? Uh, I am going to go old school. And uh, it was one of the ones that I had always seen him do when, when I saw him middling, when I saw him move to headlining. Uh, and it was one of the bits that he did on Pat Sajak, and it is the dating game. Right. You know, one one of his first, and I just, uh, it's, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, you, you have it in your mind. It is grafted to your soul, and just little moments of like the well thumbed copy of Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, and and it and it displayed sort of like kind of everything that was about him well-researched, well-written, uh, well-acted out because he had emoted the character of the serial killer, effectively, of uh, that was on the dating game. And um, are you going to play these bits or should we go I, through I, them? Or? I mean, I can, do you want to go, if you want to go through them, I can, I can dig them up and play them, whichever you'd prefer. Okay. I will, I will gladly just say the sure, bit. Sure. Um, <laughs> it is, uh, um, uh, what am I? Uh, you ever watch a dating game? What a horrible, horrible show! Uh, the, no prizes, just another contestant. That's all it is. And uh, you know, it's always like a lovely woman, you know, really beautiful, and she's always paired up with these three geeks. And uh, one guy that was on the show was a psycho, loony bin, wingnut kind of a guy. He's like, you know, they introduce him as a, okay, bachelor number two is a shadowy lurking character <laughs> from no fixed address. Please welcome. <laughs> And well thumb copy of Catching the Rye. There you go. Uh, in his pocket there. And uh, all the questions always s- laced with sexual innuendo. And just, uh, you know, like, Master number two, if I was a popsicle, what would you do to me then? <laughs> go, oh, what would I do to you? Well, first I'd uh, take your wrapper off, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And then I'd grab a hold of your sticks, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And then I'd press you against the counter till you broke in two. <laughs> Put happy in the freezer for later. <laughs> if you know what I mean. You know what I'm getting at. <laughs> that was that very voice well was exact. That was pretty verbatim. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. The voice was exact. Good job. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go on the road as a Norm Macdonald cover. <laughs> I'm gonna, it's like it's, it's, we're, we're, it's sort of like that Australian Pink Floyd, just that's like right. Canadian. Yes. Norm yeah. Macdonald. Or Gallagher. Although he was Canadian. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, near near McDonald, you know, would be enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Near McDonald. Yeah. <laughs> that's More McDonald. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. I always, I, I always loved his his smoking, the quitting, getting caught smoking when he was a kid. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And how he escalated that to you know he talked about smoking. So my dad made me smoke a big cigar and uh, have, and that's when I took up smoking cigars real heavy. I mean, just the the jokes, the punchlines were always like a surprise. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> filled me. What did he say? He called me smoking a joint, so he took me there. Filled me full of heroin. Right? It's like, I mean, it was just, it was just, yeah. That, that was one of my favorites early on in, of the classics. Hmm. Jim, do you have a have a favorite? Yeah, back in the early days, I, I liked it when he did. Uh, I saw him do it in Ottawa. Brian Mulroney and John Turner arguing in the House of Commons like school kids. <laughs> right? And. Uh, where was he, sir, when the question of nine and five came up and nearly <laughs> tore this classroom apart? And nine and five is a phrase back then when the civil servants had wanted a raise of, uh, you know, a raise and the government said, OK, we'll give you nine percent this year and five percent the next year or two years from now. So the question of nine and five and it, he just linked it to a classroom and math. And I just thought it was a, a, a fantastic line. And I just remember the roar from the crowd. When the question of nine and five nearly tore this classroom apart, it was brilliant. <laughs> Did I freeze at all during that? 
I, I got through. No, that was good. Uh, no, 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 was no, no. We got, we got it. We got it. All right. Uh, and Lara, Lara, how about yeah, you? Yeah, I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna go old school too, and then then I'm gonna sandwich in a kind of a. I'm gonna force in another comment. And so yeah, I mean, I would go back to those old bits and just the impersonations and the and the my three sons bit. You know what's the matter? And he goes, oh, there's this girl at school and. I think she kind of likes me or some clunky thing. And then I just love the clunky. And then, uh, and then, uh, well, that's what do you think, Uncle Charlie? I think you should fuck the girl, Steve. And then it just, oh, it just made me laugh every time. I think you should fuck the girl, Steve. And just the Steve at the end was so funny. And just, he did them so well. And I mean, he did them in that so, such a graceful, you know, button down suited kind of way. You know, and I just love it. And Wiener Dog was part of that, too, and the Wiener Dog. But also, I mean, yeah. as, oh, if yeah. I if I get to do one more, it's just working backwards from, well, it's official. Murder is now legal in the state of California. The yeah, fact yeah. Yes. that, and it was part of Norm's obsessive personality, that he did yeah. hundreds of O.J. Simpson shows, which was, I think, one of the finest hours of satire that that show ever produced and then yeah. that yeah. you know that this that this creepy man you know fired norm uh, because he didn't want to live with the idea that his his uh, friend uh, was a was a double murderer you know it's one of the most embarrassing uh moments in saturday night live uh history you know as yeah. far as i'm concerned but i remember turning in uh, to update, uh, to see what Norm was going to say. And I thought, fuck, that's the best joke comment you could ever, ever yeah. make, you know? Yeah. And uh, I watched the other night to both my fascination and embarrassment, 35 minutes of Norm doing O.J. Simpson's jokes. Yeah. And yeah. the variety and the... <laughs> Uh, the different ways that he worked into it. And not every one of them worked, and some of them were kind of in really bad taste. But the ones that did, you know, Johnny Cochran putting on the thing, and he's like, hey, hey, that's, that's my favorite, st that's my stabby hat. You know, it's just <laughs> really, really, really funny. And to me, that was when he was his most fearless and his most old school Lenny Bruce kind of fearless. Not doing kind of edgy jokes that you know in some cases would would piss off certain minorities and special interest groups because i don't think that that was really what norm was about you know norm was not about hurting anybody's feelings with his comedy it really was the opposite of what he set out to do and and to be and i don't think he he chose to go in that direction but norm norm was somebody who was pull, pulled to and fro you know in his career um Chris Finn once said quite famously, and I think astutely, that Norm often failed upwards, right? That Norm would, <clears throat> would, would blow another opportunity just through a kind of Dean Martin kind of style laziness of not showing up or doing another take and so on. And then he'd just be given a better and bigger opportunity. You know, and this was his way throughout his whole career, you know, but he reminded me of Oscar Levant, you know, in that way. You know, Jim, you might remember Oscar Levant. Oscar Levant was a frequent Tonight Show guest who, who struggled with mental health, began as a concert pianist, and then just became a, a raconteur, you know, and Norm, I know, loved Oscar Levant. And um, and so I'll share one comment, you know, that Norm and I used to love together. Um, and it's kind of apt because it's morbid. They asked uh, uh, Oscar Levant uh, what he wanted on his uh, tombstone when he died. And he said, uh, surrounded by idiots. And uh, <laughs> I remember Norm yeah. thought that that was very funny, you know, and that's one another memory of, you know, one of these obscure figures from that golden day of talk show raconteurship. Uh, you know, and, and this is another thing that's terribly important. A real life goal of Norm MacDonald, which he achieved, was to be the center square on Hollywood squares. And that was Norm's kind of benchmark kind of showbiz mentality. It was kind of anachronism in that way. And he did end up in the center square, I believe, uh, at least yeah. once. But he loved that. He loved that Paul Lind kind of snappy thing. He loved these fake news. He loved fake game shows. 
you know, things like the Comedy Central roasts, which were a combination of scripted funny one-liners and an ability to be a raconteur and, and, and improvise. And so Norm, to me, had two remarkable careers as one of the best stand-ups, uh, as, a, as, as a star of a short-lived but very funny a sitcom called The Norm Show, and just as one of the finest talk show raconteurs long after uh, that was something that uh, you could make a career and a living doing. And he really was a, he built, he, 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 he created a bridge between those two generations of comedy, I think like nobody else in the business. And because those two generations of comedy uh, crossed over with me, it's part of what I adored about him as a, as a, as a, as a, right. an entertainer. And, uh, yeah. you know, if, if I had, if yeah, I had on talk shows, he wanted award, to be, I will say that. But, yeah. Well, I was going to say on talk shows, he wanted to Go be on. like Tony Randall or Orson Bean. Yeah. Tony Randall. Orson yeah. Bean, yeah. yeah. Oscar Levant or, uh, yeah. you know, Bean. Yeah. Any yeah. of those guys. Totally, totally, totally. And, yeah. and, and Tony Randall is a good analogy. Because Tony Randall had that personality too. He could be catty uh-huh. and kind of bitchy and stuff. But at the end of the day, I don't, he wanted to be a gentleman, you know, uh, at least on on camera, you know. And mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and so that was, uh, you know, Norm's final Letterman set encapsulated the character oh, and the yeah. persona that I think Norm Macdonald wanted us to remember in terms of his television career, Right. Funny, inside, right? Yeah. Uh, nostalgic yeah. and ending with a heartfelt moment of, um, uh, you know, genuineness at a, on a television level. And because at that time there was only the professional image, right? Then that's all you remember for. And so mm-hmm. Johnny Carson, and we all know this, was nothing off stage, you know, and if he was anything, it was an asshole, right? And so, but Johnny Carson, and Johnny Carson said this, Johnny Carson only existed, you know, on television. And in a way, the Norm Macdonald I love only existed on television, but he gave so much to me and so much to everybody else. And then to be blessed in a very short time during a very formative part of my life, to have a personal relationship with the man is a great gift to me, and 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 I and I thank him for it. You know, wherever he is, because it, it meant a great deal to me. You know, and I miss that, and 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 I miss that part of him. You know, and I'm sorry he's gone. Yeah, nice. Well, well put. Yeah, um, I I I think we'll uh, wrap it up there. Any final thoughts from any anybody? Anything that you want to share before we? All at night. Yeah, I missed the intro. This was uh, uh, this was supposed to be about Norm Crosby, right? <laughs> <laughs> I missed the, I missed the intro, so I just I just yeah. need to remind that. Can you read uh, Bruce Clark's for me, just to remind me who who, who he is? Because <laughs> <laughs> it uh, seems to go back voice. a few years, just based on Same on what I'm seeing here. Same the joke. voice. <laughs> <laughs> That one thing we'll idea. remember near McDonald's tour. I think that's a good idea. One thing we'll remember about Ro, uh, Norm is that he was prophylactic. Do you remember that bit? <laughs> that's right. What yeah. <laughs> some people are pro. pro hey, breeder. And some people are yeah. pro. But I'm pro. I'm prophylactic. Yeah. <laughs> but that was Norm's. But it's interesting too, Jim. That was Norm's way in to any contentious issue. Was was just a funny joke and a pun, and then move on. Yeah, because yeah. I don't know that Norm was uh, pro-choice, and I don't, you know, I I care who's pro-choice and not pro-choice, but for the for the purpose of this conversation, um, I don't care, and it doesn't really matter. But it is a revelation mm-hmm. as to that Norm had an en- was an entertainer, and so mm-hmm. he wouldn't rock any boat, you know. And he was his own man. He had his own opinions uh, about many things. And some of them were very engaging. Some of them were batshit. Some of them were uh, provocative. Some of them were strange. But, you know, he's a complex uh, figure, yeah. a complex human being, and a terrific uh, entertainer. Yeah. And we got uh, lots of YouTube of him to watch, so that's good. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. That 
That has been one of the best things about this, if if you can say a best thing, is that everyone gets to find the the bit of norm that they love and throw it into the internet and say, here's something that I adore. And if you're lucky enough to be in the same feed yeah. and be able to, to catch them, it's it's a celebration. Uh, you know, there, there's not there's not often that you get to say that social media does one thing well, but it is that it, it becomes sort of like this archive yeah. of of people presenting things. And there's uh, there's norm clips that I didn't realize existed out there, whether it was him on his podcast, him on someone else's podcast, doing panel on a show, telling a, a street joke, maybe <clears throat> a, a clip from an obscure uh, Stand up set that you you didn't know about him taking down a heckler on a on a recording that was done in a comedy club. I mean, like all of those things kind of come together and help build out the the story and the and the character. In this beautiful this guy was comedically and as a person, and it's gorgeous. Yeah, well, Laura's sentiments are exactly the same. We were just it was a privilege to kind of know him and at the end of the day and, and and observe a man who was eccentric and quirky and funny and. Uh, you know, you learn a little bit about human behavior by knowing people like that. So that's all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, You're welcome. We thank lost, you. We lost Jim. <laughs> Jim threw his head, uh, headphones down like that yeah. famous Tom Brokaw, Lee Harvey Oswald uh, interview from 1987. Yeah, 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 yeah. If I may make a Dennis Miller style uh, obscure yeah. reference the, there. Yeah. Or the Dave yeah. Hodge. It, it only took Canada. a pen being thrown that threw off Dave Hodge off. I just said the same thing, Todd. That's so. hilarious. <laughs> I think Jim, given his age, Jim, I think Jim might have had a bubbly tummy. <laughs> <laughs> bubbly tummy. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Well, thank we'll you. See ya. Thank you. Good thank night you. from Winnipeg. See yes. See you later. Uh, I was in L.A., and, and he, of course, he's getting me to drive him around everywhere. So he was still working for Roseanne at the time. So I drove him to work, and we pull into the CBS lot. And I don't. I said, where do I park? There's no visitor. And he said, oh, park right here, man. And he's insistent that I park in this spot. It says on the curb, like George Wachowski or something, right? So I parked there, and, I, and I'm not thinking about it. And the Larry Sanders lot was there. So we went in there and looked around. He's trying, he wants to steal the mug off Larry's desk. Right. Uh, and I said, don't do that. And so he, you know, and then we, we come out <laughs> and I find out that the parking spot is Jerry Seinfeld's. And the, just a week before Seinfeld had a run in <laughs> with somebody that parked in that spot. And so luckily Jerry didn't come out, but here he is. He's trying to get me in trouble with, you know, one of my idols and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, what can I get away with? That's, that really was his, <laughs> his modus operandi back then. I think you were breaking up a little bit, but I almost thought you said that Jerry Seinfeld was one of your idols. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, correct. I see. I see what you did there. <laughs> all right well thank you again everybody for sharing today and i really appreciate it and and everyone have a great night take care who are these people call us if you need more audio drops Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, something exciting. Our our next guest made his uh, stand-up debut. I did not remember that. This man began his television stand-up debut with us 25 years ago. Didn't know that. I didn't know that. Very talented actor. Nobody funnier. Ladies and gentlemen, Norm MacDonald. Thanks, guys. Listen, I don't want to brag or anything, but uh, me and Oprah are making the same money tonight. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) the show has loosened up considerably, I noticed. (laughs) I was watching Oprah and uh, Dave talking about weed and booze. (laughs) I don't do either of those. The hardest drug I ever did, LSD. (laughs) And... uh, 
I remember as a kid, I was like 16, and I remember they told, warned me, they said, hey, you gotta be careful with that LSD on account of you can get a flashback. 10 years can go by, 20 years, 30 years, and a flashback will happen. So I thought, hey, that seems like a good deal. <laughs> you, know, you, you tell me I buy a drug for $5, I eat it, I get high, and then 20 years later, I get high again? <laughs> That's not the point. I like to stretch my drug dollar. The point is this. <laughs> 10 years have passed, 20 years have passed, 30 years have passed, and no flashbacks. What a jip that turned out to be. <laughs> Just more horse <laughs> by the big acid companies. That's all it is. But I can't believe it's been a quarter century since I made my television debut. It was all different back then. You know, it was back then, I remember if you wanted to take a picture, you would use a camera. <laughs> Not a telephone. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if you used a telephone, people would look at you odd. <laughs> you know, just stay still, I guess. <laughs> what about in the old days when they took pictures of you way, way back, you know, where they pulled that thing and it exploded and stuff? <laughs> I got a picture of my great grandfather. The thing took six hours to uh, take your picture, and uh, it was a picture of my great grandfather, one. They only had, every guy had one picture back then. <laughs> and it's just him, like. I gotta get back, feed them hogs. <laughs> Who's gonna feed the hogs? <laughs> Somebody gotta feed them hogs. Now, in the future, of course, it'll be different. 50 years from now, people will be going like, hey, you wanna uh, see 100,000 pictures of my great-grandfather? <laughs> I got him right here, plus everything he did every day of his life. <laughs> hey, this occurred to me today. Uh, ID, ID, which I had to show it again. There's a strange abbreviation when you think about it. I is short for I. <laughs> and then D is short for dentification. <laughs> They could have split that one up a little better, you know? <laughs> but I watch the TV, I watch the news, make you afraid of the news, you know? Put all these stories on, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, you know, try to scare you, you know? But does it ever really scare you? Like, you ever wake up in the middle of the night, ah, North Korea! <laughs> that little tiny country across the ocean. I wonder if they'll get me. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, didn't MASH settle that like 20 years ago? <laughs> Why do I have to watch that stupid show? There is one country that worries me, though. Not Iraq, not Iran, not North Korea. The only country that really worries me is uh, the country of Germany. I don't know if you guys are history buffs or not, but... Uh, <laughs> In the early uh, part of the previous century, Germany decided to go to war. And uh, who did they go to war with? The world. <laughs> that had never been tried before. <laughs> and uh, so you figure that would take about five seconds for the world to win, but uh, no, it was actually close. <laughs> About, then about 30 years pass, and uh, Germany decides again to go to war, and again it chooses as its enemy the world. <laughs> <laughs> and this time they have that guy, shkankly, shkankly, that guy. And I'm not even going to dignify him by saying his name, but I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> 
But you'd think at that point the world would go, listen, Germany, here's the deal. You don't get to be a country no more on account of you keep attacking the world. I mean, what, do you, what do you think, you're Mars or something? Anyways, listen, folks, this will be my last time on uh, the David Letterman show, I understand. <laughs> and you know, you know, you guys, we all know that David Letterman was the greatest talk show who, uh, host who ever lived. But I... <laughs> I remember... Dave differently because the first time I saw him, I was 13 years old. I was living in. Uh, <laughs> 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 I was living in Toronto, Canada, and I went to a talk show they had there. And uh, David Letterman was the stand-up comedian on the show, and uh, I loved stand-up. And David Letterman did this joke that I told everybody. This joke, I love this joke. It still uh, stays with me as my favorite stand-up joke ever. So I'd like to do it for you if you'd like to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, um, I, uh, I, I was on the street the other day and uh, I, uh, I saw a garbage truck and on the back of the garbage truck, there was a small sign that said, please do not follow too closely. <laughs> Another of life's simple pleasures, ruined by a meddling bureaucracy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you remember the old days when, when Dad would pile the kids in the station wagon and we'd all go out and follow a garbage truck? <laughs> So anyways, I'd just like to say, I know that uh, Mr. Letterman is uh, 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 not for the mockish, and uh, he, has, uh, he has no truck for the sentimental. But if something is true, it is not sentimental. And I say in truth, I love you. Oh, my God. 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 Very funny, Norm, and thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Norm MacDonald, ladies and gentlemen. That was very sweet, Norm. Good night, everybody. Now, stay tuned for James Corden. This is Alan. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Corient. Corient provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding your expectations and simplifying your life. Corient has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Corient has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Corient has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of planning, investing, lending, and money management disciplines. Leverage Corient's exclusive network of experts to craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex they may be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, connect with a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. That's C-O-R-I-E-N-T.com. Corient.com. Looks like you need a vacation. Enter the five-hour energy Where Will the Tide Take You sweepstakes. You could win a $10,000 dream beach vacation. Imagine jet setting off to a tropical paradise, having fun in the sun, or diving at a gorgeous reef. 
It's up to you. No purchase necessary. Go to 5HETide.com for official rules and to enter. That's 5HETide.com. Enter today. Ends June 30th, 2024.